significantly humbled to be here when you're following someone like Jon Snow. Uh, it's a bit of a difficult act to follow, but uh, I'll do the very best I can. Uh, I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about how my career started in terms of uh, broadcasting, because it was rather unusual, to say the least. Um, I did start out life as a teacher. I did a history degree at Leeds University, and I know you are the third university in Leeds, so let me make that to quite clear as well. Um, so, I'm, in, a, in a sense, it was a very strange route for me to take. Um, I did have this desire, though, to do broadcasting, and whilst I was working as a history teacher, um, I started to work on Radio Leeds, which was just starting out, really, in its infancy. Um, and I was very lucky to work alongside a guy called John Hell, who became a great friend of mine, and who I know Mike will know very well from Yorkshire Television as well. Uh, and uh, John inspired me to uh, stick at it against all the odds. And that is one of the message, messages I'm going to say to you today. Stick at it. Do not be put off by people saying it's a competitive business. Every job's competitive. This one is a real challenge to you. That's the first message anyway. So wh when did I decide that maybe broadcasting was uh, the right road for me rather than perhaps uh, teaching? Well, I enjoy teaching. And I can remember speaking to a, a, a group of 14-year-old boys one Friday afternoon, and we were doing the Kings and Queens of England. It was 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock was home time. They couldn't wait to get out of the class. And I said, right, lads, because they were all lads, who followed Mary? And this boy at the back said, her little lamb. I thought at that point, <laughs> I thought at that point, this was the time that I should start to consider something different, and I did. Um, I persisted at Radio Leeds, very seriously persisted. I wouldn't take no for an answer. Uh, I was lucky enough to get involved on a Saturday, and then I had two breaks, really. The first break was a, a fire at Leeds Market in 1975. Very famous fire, virtually disintegrated the whole of the market in Leeds. And it happened at around 6 o'clock, just as I was finishing um, my stint as a, um, a sports journalist for the afternoon. And they suddenly went on air with a two-hour special programme, and I fronted this programme simply because there was nobody else around to do it. And that was the first big um, moment I had. And that's the second message I'd like to sort of uh, relate to you as well. Take the chances that are offered at any point that you get. Just t take the moment, seize the opportunity, and make sure that you're there to be able to uh, stand in if you get the opportunity. Um, so then I became uh, known to the management at to Radio Leeds, and then they turned around and eventually gave me a very stark offer. It was in 1977, I think it was. I was head of history at this point at a school called Redillion School near Wakefield. Loved teaching, didn't have a problem with it. And then they turned around to me and said this. We'll give you a three-month contract. That's all. A three-month contract to work on news and sport. No guarantees that anything will happen at the end of it. And I took that gamble. And it was a gamble, believe you me. And fortunately, I've been in employment ever since. So the next point I'm saying is, if you get a sniff, if you get the chance, grab it. Grab it. Especially in the current environment. And then I was lucky. Uh, because uh, Leeds United... Um, I say lucky. Uh, Leeds United were relegated. Uh, it was a big news story, and suddenly everybody wanted to know about um, uh, why Leeds United had gone from being this superstar team to being a very, very ordinary team. I was banned three times, once by Alan Clark, once by Jimmy Adamson, and uh, another, another manager who had even forgotten who it was. They banned us because of the work that we were doing, and we were quite sort of critical. Uh, about Leeds United. And I had my most embarrassing moment at Leeds United as well, uh, covering a, a big match prior to this in 1975, when Leeds United were in the um, European Cup, as it was then. We, um, I was doing the Leeds United match on that particular night, and uh, there was a rather suave and sophisticated New Zealander um, in um, the chair doing a programme called In Town Tonight. Uh, and the exchange between us went something like this. He said, um, well, tonight is one of the biggest nights in the history of Leeds United Football Club. Leeds United, the champions of England, will be taking on 
Real Madrid, the champions of Spain. 45,000 people are packed into Ellen Road, and one man lucky enough to be there is our sports commentator, Harry Gresham. Good evening, and welcome to Ellen Road, with the sensational news that Billy Bremner has pissed his fatness test. <laughs> It's the kind of mistake you make which you think might threaten your career. Uh, fortunately, it didn't. Um, I worked, worked for Radio Leeds until 1982, uh, and then I was given, again, a very similar uh, challenge to go and join Look North. Um, I'm staff now. I'm a member of staff, so uh, I have more privileges than I, than I used to have. But in those days, it was just what we call a minutage contract. I don't even know, Mike, whether... Yorkshire, I know you were heavily involved then, used to do this. But what used to happen was this. When we got on air, we were paid by the minute. So if we did a, a report uh, and it was three minutes long, you got a three-minute fee. Uh, all our reports, you suddenly found, were three minutes and one second long because that was a four-minute fee. So we learned to use this, uh, this particular... Um, a device to make sure we got more money. But it was a strange system, and yet it worked. It was done very fairly, because the editor made sure that you got uh, enough money to be able to survive as a freelance. And then I got noticed by uh, BBC Sport, which has been the most um, exhilarating part of my career, I suppose, because this has led to me now covering six Olympic Games, six Summer Olympic Games, four Winter Olympic Games. I've been to World Cups, uh, I've been to golf events, I've been to Wimbledon three years. Um, I've covered events all around the world. I've been so privileged to be able to do that. Um, my first Olympic Games was Seoul, 1988. Uh, and I um, remember that very, very vividly because uh, uh, the BBC went en masse to Seoul then. And we just covered the Games from start to finish. Just as you're about to experience this time round as well. I think we were talking, Mike, weren't we, just before we came on about just how many um, uh, hours the BBC will be giving you of Olympic coverage from July the 27th to August the 11th, 12th. It's thousands and thousands of hours. Everything will be on BBC One, BBC Two. I believe that's right. For me, that's absolutely right. It's a once-in-a-lifetime experience in this country, um, and we're not going to get the Olympics back again for another 100 years or so. So let's embrace it and let's go along with it. So the Olympics for me, that started, and I remember my moment of, uh, I suppose one of the funniest moments I, I enjoyed was at um, Atlanta in 1986. Um, I got quite friendly with David Coleman, one of the great doyens of uh, broadcasting. And uh, David Coleman and I used to go running together in the days when I could do a bit of running. Um, and we used to go running every morning before breakfast. And on this particular occasion, he was coming towards the end of his career and his running days were over. And he was told that when he was going to be met at the airport, that um, he would be uh, met by this guy who would do everything for him. And that's exactly what happened. This guy was very obsequious in his delivery. And he went up to uh, David Coleman and he said, Mr. Coleman, it's a, a great privilege, if I may say, to have you here to the United States of America. Uh, you are regarded as one of the greatest broadcasters I know in the world. Your um, uh, fantastic coverage of Munich, your commentaries for athletics over the years. You are a, an absolute giant. All I can say to you is this, and it went on and on like this. All I say to you is this, is if there is anything I can do for you, please let me know. Coleman said, yes, yeah, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Sorry about that, but it, I couldn't say shut the F up, could I, I have to say it. So that's, that's the kind of characters that you're, uh, you're, you're dealing with all the time. Um, for me, I think I look back now at uh, a career which has uh, spanned 30 years as a presenter. I started in 82. I worked alongside Judith Stamper. Um, I worked with Claire Frisbee. Uh, I now work alongside Krista, Krista Aykroyd. Um, and um, I've been there 30 years. I'm 61 and a half. Um, I'm probably <coughs> on my way out to a certain extent now, certainly in the next two or three years. Um, they'll be thinking about replacing me, if not before. 
and they'll want somebody different to take on. What, what would I say to you have been the biggest influences as far as I'm concerned? When I started, we worked on film, which meant that we were sent to Lincoln or wherever, and we had to bring the film back and had to have the film developed. So you couldn't start editing anything until 40 minutes, 50 minutes after you got back. Now, nowadays, of course, it's instant. We've got um, uh, videotape. I say videotape. It's, it's uh, developed so much more significantly uh, than that. We've got that, which gives us instant, instant ability to be able to edit. And the, the way, I'm sure that John Snow probably mentioned how technology has affected his career as well, makes it so much easier. We've got live satellite links that can um, bring you everything. We never had that when I first started. You used to have to book a satellite and then hopefully you might get something that, uh, that sort of worked a little bit. And yet now we've got the instant ability to make news. We've got abilities to be able to... Um, edit ourselves as video journalists. I, I, I can edit very badly, and I won't even try and do anything complicated, but I can do a headline sequence if I have to. And that's the way that you'll find your world will develop. You've got Nicola Rees coming, one of our very best journalists uh, from Look North later in the week. May I urge you to come along and, and listen to how she um, will talk about the way that she puts pieces together and the way that she's managed to, to win uh, awards. It's been absolutely incredible. Um, so that's the future. The future is you go out and film it, you come back and edit it, and that's the way it's got to be. So I always say to aspiring journalists this, be different. Be different. Don't be conformist. Look at me in a bloody suit here today. I am the conformist person because I'm expected to wear a suit. And I'm on late tonight, and I won't finish until quarter to 11, so I've not even got time to go home this evening after this. So I'm ready for work. But to be different, that's up to you. I don't know whether you've noticed, um, there is a, a media correspondent for the BBC at the moment. I don't even know his name, but he's got the most ridiculous hairstyle that you've ever seen. And he's a real character. A real character. He's different and brings, brings it to life. That's what you need to do. Try and, try and, can I say, try and make sure that you've got your own style. It's very difficult to, to say what your own style is, isn't it? But it might be what you wear. It might be the way that you develop a piece. It might be the way that you write. But be different. Because when you go for a job, and don't be put off by people saying, oh, it's competitive. Of course it's competitive. And so it should be competitive. Because we want to get the best people working for our organisation. But try and offer them something different. Take them a tape that you think has got something that's different. Something that shows your personality. There are always dilemmas that you come across uh, over 30 years. And I, I confess, I suppose, I, I look back on one in particular that caused me great angst. Uh, the Valley Parade fire when 50-odd people died, um, Bradford City against Lincoln. Um, a very, very tragic event. But particularly so for me, because um, I got my uncle a ticket for that match, and I never saw him again. I was sent down, to, in fact, it was covered by um, Yorkshire Television. Brilliant commentary by John Helm. Uh, I don't suppose you'll ever get a chance to see it, but... If you want to hear, hear somebody measured in a horrible, horrible tragedy, the way that John did it that day was fantastic. Um, so I went, was sent down on this Saturday and Sunday, and I did a piece to camera, and it was quite clear that I was very emotional. My editor took me off the story, quite right, because I was too involved in it. That was a, a real dilemma for me, was that, to be able to cope with those situations. And people often say, do you get affected by stories? Do you get affected by the way that individual stories develop sometimes and do, do, they, do they make you think, do they make you feel upset? Well, they do, actually. I think that's the nature of regional television. I think that's probably what distinguishes it between regional and national. You know, John, I'm sure, uh, is used to talking about uh, mass murder in Syria and <coughs> Iraq as a matter of course and gets used to it. We're not in Yorkshire. We don't get that kind of thing very often. 
And so when you do hear of something like Valley Parade or Hillsborough happening, you suddenly think that's somebody, in my case, somebody I knew and somebody who I said to myself at the time, I sent to a football match and never saw him again. And it has an effect on you. Um, so you've got to be professional and, and try and get over, over that side of things as best you can. Um, one of the great joys, I think, of, of, of working for the BBC um, is that we still regard ourselves, I think, as, as the leaders of certain aspects. Sometimes it's <coughs> slightly misguided, but other times I think we are right in what we do. I believe our standards of journalism are still as high as anybody. And it's still true to say that in any crisis that you get, any crisis, the BBC is the channel that people tend to turn to. Do they turn there because they trust it? I think they do. Do they turn there because they think that the reporters that they use are the most reliable? I think they do. That does not mean to say for one moment that um, what the opposition does is not as good. Sometimes it's a lot better. It's just that the BBC, because you pay your licence for your hundred and whatever it is a month, you feel a, a duty sometimes, or a lot of people do, to actually tune in and listen. So when it comes to royal weddings, when it comes to royal deaths, like Diana, the BBC figures are always very, very significant. Um, and, and I think that's a, an interesting point, and maybe something that you want to, to raise a little later on, as to why that is the case. Or indeed, if it still is the case. Um, we shall see. Um, so going back to my um, Olympics, I went to um, Seoul in 1988, I went to Barcelona in 92, uh, Atlanta in 96. Um, the best of them all was definitely um, Australia in 2000. That was absolutely phenomenal, was that. The way that the whole country embraced the, the idea of the Olympics was something, something to behold. And it's something I hope that we will do in this country as well uh, later on this year. Uh, Athens in 2004, Beijing. And now, for me, full circle, London 2012. Um, I've got a strange role in this one. Um, I'm going to be going around quite a few different sports, which is what I want to do. And then I'm going to be working, <laughs> rather surprising is this, on a 3D output every night. Right, OK. Um, I'm bad enough here, but in 3D, I don't know what I would look like. So we shall see what that, that, that turns out to be. But that just shows you how television is changing. 3D, for God's sake. 3D television. And that's going to be the future, isn't it? We're going to be talking about this all the time. The technology that changes. And we've got all these fees coming in here. Um, you know, uh, I'll probably say what a tosser this, this guy is talking about. <laughs> there we are. I can, I can cope with that. I'll I'm, uh, I'm tweet as much as I can. Um, but basically, that's the technology. Now, we've got to embrace it as well. And it's quite difficult for someone like me to suddenly start tweeting. And I have done. I've been tweeting for the last year or so now. And sometimes I enjoy it, sometimes I don't. But the technology now is such that, look north, we're asked to tweet. We're asked to be on Facebook. We're asked to interact with the audience as much as we can. So if they've got a view on a story, then we actually um, reflect that um, opinion uh, as best we can on the programme. In the old days... My editor would have said, damn the public. We don't care what they say. This is what we're doing. We can't do that anymore now. We've got to listen to what, to what people say and, and, and what people do. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about the World Cup that I covered. Um, in 1986, uh, Mexico. What a trip that was. And I only stood in for that trip because, I did, do some of you remember, you may not remember the name, David Icke. Does it ring a bell to anybody? David Icke was a very good sports reporter who suddenly thought he was Jesus. He thought he was Jesus. Um, and fortunately for me, he wouldn't fly. So they rang me up and said, would I go to uh, Mexico to work on the World Cup? And of course I said, mm, I'll think about it. Yes, please. So I did. Um, and we did what was called there at the time a lot of off-tube commentaries. Off-tube commentaries. Um, and these commentaries were, basically, you were 200 miles away from where the football action was taking place. And I was working uh, with a guy called Archie McPherson. 
a very, very well-known, experienced Scottish football commentator, about six foot eight, and he had a Weetabix on the top of his head. I can talk, can't I? But um, his preparation the night before uh, the game that we had was a, a bottle of Bell's whiskey. <laughs> and I'm not joking, I mean a bottle of Bell's whiskey. And I was his spotter, which meant that um, what I used to have to do was I had to try and identify the uh, goal scorers and try and help him out as a commentator. Well, the game we got was Bulgaria against North Korea. <laughs> yes, not exactly the one that John Motson fancied, I can tell you. But this game was interesting. North Korea, we knew we'd get away with because they were totally unknown. But Bulgaria had some decent players. They had Stoichkov, Irazakov, Pushkas, people like that. Very, very good players. Anyway, Archie started his commentary. We were into it. And he said, it, and it's Bulgaria with the ball. And it's number seven for Bulgaria with the ball. And he passes the ball inside to number eight for Bulgaria. I was worried. The ball comes across. It's a goal for Bulgaria. Puts his hand over the mic and said, Harry, who scored? I said, booger off, I don't know. <laughs> and booger off has scored for Bulgaria. <laughs> so it's that kind of thing that you learn to live with. Uh, over the years that, that give you, I think, something special about why working for the B for me has been part and parcel of things. I wonder if I could just show you um, something now that happened on uh, Look North over the last week. I'm not, I'm not claiming, nor would I ever, to say I'm a great journalist. I'm not. Um, I try my best. I don't think I've caused uh, problems in terms of getting people to sue us and libel us, and that's very important these days. What we try and do now is we, we try and cover events that I think are significant. I'm going to show you this one about Arthur Scargill. It re-emerged for me because the minor strike was one of the moments where I did actually get telling off from my editor. And this was to do with the fact that uh, I was very concerned about um, uh, communities being really, really uh, trodden on and hard done to at the time. And I can remember volunteering on one morning to go and help a soup kitchen in Glasshouten. Just helping, that's all it was. Uh, and it was a soup kitchen, because nobody had any money uh, or food at all. And my editor called me and said, you can't do that because you're taking sides. OK, I understand that, and uh, I learned a lesson from it. But what happened on this occasion, for this story about Arthur Scargill last week, was that he was back in court. The great champion of the NUM was in court against the NUM because he was claiming money. I'm going to show you, if it works, fingers crossed, this sequence which shows the report about what happened and an interview afterwards with a very crusty uh, journalist, uh, Paul Routledge, who's been around a long time, still a columnist, by the way, for the Daily Mirror. And just see what you think of this exchange as to whether or not uh, it tells a story the way it should do. Thank you very much. Fingers crossed. Welcome to the programme. First this evening, the former leader of the National Union of Mine Workers, Arthur Scargill, who spent years fighting the government on behalf of his workers, has today won his own dispute against the trade union. Yes, Mr Scargill was awarded £13,000 in damages after suing a trust fund of the union he led for over 20 years over expenses. Alan Whitehouse reports from Sheffield. He's no stranger to legal controversy. Even ten years after stepping down as president of the Miners' Union, Arthur Scargill still has a public following. And today's result at Sheffield's County Court left him in defiant mood. Sad that I've had to bring an action against the National Union of Mine Workers, Yorkshire Area Trust Fund Trustees. But all I was doing was trying to enforce a contract of employment freely signed in 2002. Mr Scargill led the National Union of Mine Workers for 20 years, but this case centred on what happened after he retired in 2002. He took on a job as a consultant to the Yorkshire and Lancashire branches of the union. The court heard he was being paid the costs of two landline phones to his home near Barnsley, the calls and rental for a mobile phone, and a car allowance payable every two years. It was the union's decision to stop these payments that triggered the court case. And the judge accepted many of Mr Scargill's arguments. 
He awarded him £12,000 for the car allowance, with another £1,000 because he'd been denied union membership for almost a year. But he rejected Mr Scargill's claim that his landline and mobile phone bills should be paid as well. The NUM's only a fraction of its former size. At the start of the Great Miners' Strike in 1984, there were 187,000 union members. These days there are around 5,000. And the union says it's now these members who will be paying the costs of today's hearing. The phone bills that Arthur's been paid, or had paid for him for the last eight years, he wasn't entitled to. Um, morally, I don't know whether Arthur will now be looking to pay back the money that he's had for the last eight years and offset it against the car allowance. And even this isn't the end of the row. A second court hearing is scheduled for later this year over a London flat, which the union pays for, but which Mr Scargill claims is his to use for the rest of his life. Alan Whitehouse, BBC Book North, Sheffield. Well, joining us now is Daily Mirror journalist and Arthur Scargill biographer Paul Routledge. Paul, has he won? Well, it's a famous victory for Arthur, isn't it? Um, it's just a pity that it's a victory over his union rather than over an employer, uh, which was what really his job was in the old days. It's a victory, I suppose, and it, it means he can laugh all the way to the bank, except perhaps just as far as the nearest garage where he can get a new Ford Mondeo. I, I, just, I just wonder what a miner coming out at Kellingley Colliery will make of all this when he watches this. Well, that's the big picture, isn't it? Uh, the miners' union has, I think, fewer than 1,500 members, possibly fewer than even 1,000. Uh, it has really no money coming in. And does it really need this kind of uh, sordid legal action that's bilking the whole union of its funds? It's, it's terrible. It's, it's cost so far, I suspect, about £30,000, including costs. And it may cost twice that much. And there are two more court cases to come. You, you know what he said there? This was a point of principle. Well, it always is with Arthur. Uh, but, of course, it, he sees the principle as always being on his side, whereas the Union thought they had some justice too. Otherwise, they wouldn't have taken the action that they did and defended the action the way that they did. I know when we talked to you uh, a few days ago, your, your advice was that both parties should almost move away from this. They haven't, and no. they're not going to, are no, they? No, they seem to be locked deeper and deeper into a kind of horrendous uh, clash, which could go on for the rest of this year. Uh, it's not good for the union. I mean, what, what miner now at Kellingley will come out and say, I think I should join the NUM because of all of this? They won't. Because it's the NUM has no power at all, is that what you're saying? Or no well, credibility? Well, uh, or uh, uh, because why do you want to join a union that's suddenly locked in the legal struggle with its former president and is not negotiating uh, pay or doing things that it should be doing? You, you, you can't have the eye on, on the, the main board and keep going back and forth to court just to fight the former president. And uh, this will go, go back to court? Oh, uh, they may or may May not appeal on this one, but there is another case about his expenses to come, and then there's the case uh, later in the year about the million pound flat in the Barbican in London. We're probably booking for that as well, Paul. Oh. Given which indeed. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Next I, tonight. The, uh, the, the great thing about that, from my point of view, is that obviously the person we wanted was Scargill, and he wouldn't do the interview. That's a regular thing now from him. He's become a very difficult man to tie down. So, what you've got to try and do, from our point of view, is try and get somebody who can at least put it in perspective in a different way. You know, he's a different kind of journalist, was Paul, and he told us what we wanted to know, and, uh, and basically uh, is telling us this incredible story, think about it, of an NUM president for life, and he's got, in London, a £1 million flat that he can have for the rest of his life. And as Paul said, uh, he, qu he queried our figures, there's probably only 1,000 members in the union. It's astonishing, isn't it, uh, when, you, when you look at, at, at that side of things. So that's one element of what we try and do um, on, a, on a regular basis and try and bring uh, stories together. And you've got to bear in mind that people are savvy these days about doing interviews. If they don't want to do an interview, they won't do them. So you've got to really uh, be thinking on your feet to try and get somebody who can add to the story and not diminish the story. And that was one example there. I'll just give you one final example, if I may. Um, a story which is quite close to my heart. I live in York. It's about a, a retail development uh, called Monk's Cross in York. And the story is basically that um, the town centre, the city centre of York, great historical place, is dying. It's dying on its feet. There's lots of empty shops. Now, what we've done this time around on this one is... One of our reporters has tried to do something slightly different on the story, and then we've done an interview, uh, a, a confrontational interview, if you like, but not confrontational in the way that Paxman would do it, with the leader of York City Council, James Alexander. Uh, I hope we're just about 
there on this one, are we? Thank you very much. Before that, though, out of town or city centre is an argument about shopping that's been heard across our region many times. In particular, relevant in York, where traders fear that the expansion of Monk's Cross Shopping Centre could do them out of business. Now, they say if the plans are approved, the city will have as much out of town shopping as there is at Meadowhall and will kill the city centre. Supporters, of course, say it will deliver growth, jobs, and a new sports stadium. In a moment, we'll hear from the council leader, but first, here's Danny Carpenter. York, as a city, is on the horns of a dilemma. Developers promising growth and jobs want to build out of town. They also promise a community stadium, which is supported by the council. Existing traders say the new development threatens growth and jobs in town. Phil Davis is a retail analyst. He helped launch Meadowhall. Now he helps councils fix their town centres. We took him for a walk into the city. When there's a recession on, when town centres are struggling to, to win back businesses, hair salons like this and, and lady salons are the ones that tend to pop up quite quickly because they're low cost. So you do see a lot of hairdressers in a town centre that's struggling. Hairdressers, estate agents, pawnbrokers are all, he says, signs of decline. And so are charity shops. It tells us the city's struggling already. It tells us that uh, already with the debate taking place, Retailers are nervous, they're moving out and charity shops are moving in. A combination of the city's existing out-of-town shopping, the recession and fear over the new proposals is, he says, already having an impact. And he's adamant, more shops out of town means less money in town. Look at what's happened in South Yorkshire, for example, where Rotherham was really set into decline 20 years ago by the arrival of Meadowhall. The same will happen here. It won't happen overnight, but it'll be a gradual decline. And he says the offer of a much-cherished community sports stadium is just a distraction in an important debate. What we need to be talking about is whether the, the retail sustainability of York, or indeed Monks Cross 2, is, is, is appropriate. And the fact that we introduce into it the offer of a stadium alongside it is a complete red herring. His assessment? A city in decline and on the edge. A view completely at odds with the council and the developers. Danny Carpenter, BBC Look North, York. Danny, thank you. Well, that's one quite bleak view, which I put to the leader of the City of York Council, James Alexander. Well, I, I would dispute that. Uh, already we have a, a city centre that's very vibrant, got the sixth lowest shop vacancy rate in the UK. And we already have an element of out-of-town retail with the designer outlet or with existing Monks Cross, and yet the city centre is still doing relatively well. But he says... If you look at non-retail shops, there are very few shops around when you go down, say, Micklegate and Stonegate, or at least there are a lot of empty shells there. Well, I think he needs to also take into account the entire offer of York. We have 7.1 million visitors here, uh, and also he is talking down York. It's his job to be able to support uh, inner town uh, redevelopment, but actually we need to look at the entirety of York and what's here on offer. But the out-of-town experience will affect the inner city experience. It's bound to. People just don't have the money at all. You must accept that. They can't spend money at Monk's Cross 2 and then spend money down Stonegate, down Micklegate, down Coney Street. But this is also about attracting more people into York in general, not just the existing people who are shopping here. And also that development will also include a £10 million revamp of the Parliament Street uh, Marks and Spencer store. And on top of that, the council is investing in the public realm. And today I can also announce that we're going to invest a significant amount of money into doing up our market linked to the Porters Review to further help the city centre. One of the main arguments that the, the shop owners in the middle of the city centre have is that it's not a level playing field. The parking is high, the rates are high, and so on. What can you do to at least say to them, you're thinking about this and you're going to do something about it if Monk's Cross does happen? But well, there's a few things. Already uh, there isn't a level playing field because there is a significant footfall of people wanting to visit York and see the historic assets in the city centre. And the best shopping experience in York is again in the city centre. If there was no community stadium, none of this would happen anyway, would it? Well, there's, there's two elements to it. There's uh, two different uh, applications that are being put forward. One is just, just genuine retail expansion, and the other one is retail expansion as part of enabling development. Both are outside of our normal planning guidelines, and without some form of enabling development, uh, I, I would be surprised if it went forward. James Alexander, the leader of your council. Thank you very much. Th thank you. Um, 
the reason that I, I've chosen that one is to try and show you that our brief now is to be is to take the political leaders to task, but not row with them. We're not supposed to row with them. It's supposed to be a measured argument, and we're not Jeremy Paxman. Now, Newsnight's a different kettle of fish, so that's what we try and do in our journalism now. The story there was a very simple one, and one which I think he, as leader of the council, handled very well. I don't know what your re uh, reaction to him was, but he handled it very well. He didn't lose his temper. I certainly was respectful in my questions to him. But I thought he came out of that pretty well. And that's the kind of thing that, that we're asked to do on a regular basis and the kind of thing that you will be asked to do um, if you become a journalist and television journalist as well. So I suppose the message from me is, is really, when you're talking about your showreel, try and make sure that you've got as much on that showreel that shows the, the, um, the depth of what you can achieve, whether it's a hard interview, whether it's a soft interview, uh, whether it's a good piece to camera in a different location, because that's what's happening all the time now. Watch the news at 10. You now see pieces to camera done by reporters, literally within seconds of an event having taken place that they're going to use later. Uh, somebody's been sacked, and they're right behind them. The people have been sacked, the football manager's right behind them, the piece to camera's taking place. There's almost a bit of a, a challenge going on, yet the most unusual piece to camera. I think there is that to it. And who can get the, the best shot that uh, helps bring these things together? So that's really my message of my sort of 30-odd years of uh, broadcasting, uh, just to try and, and say to you, really, um, go for it. Please go for it. If I can help in any way, get in touch with me. I'll do what I can to, to see if I can encourage you to come down and, uh, and see a programme go out at Look North and see if I can instil in you that, uh, that need to um, continue in what you're doing. But you must have some questions, I hope you have. So please, will you fire away with them? Yeah? Uh, well, I don't do Super League Show now. I've got rid of that. Um, I, I've had a very bad illness. I was off for three months uh, prior to uh, Christmas, and uh, I've sort of backpedaled a little bit. Um, I, I mean, Look North is my life. Um, I've been doing it for 30 years with one year. Well, it's a strange thing. I took one year out of the BBC completely, and then I did four years at South Today in Southampton, and then came back to Look North in 99. So it's been my life as Look North, and I treasure the programme as much as anybody can. Uh, it's got its flaws, but it, for me, it provides a, a, a very good service. Um, but if you're asking which I, which I prefer now, I'm happy with Look North, really am. I nearly, I nearly got a job um, uh, in BBC Sport, a full-time job, uh, back in 1987, I think it was, when... Um, the job was coming up for Sports Night, which used to be the midweek programme. And it was left to a choice of between me and a guy called Steve Ryder. You may remember Steve. He, he's useless, he is, but anyway. Um, and Steve got the job, quite rightly too, as well. And I can remember for the feedback, um, the head of sport, a guy called uh, Jonathan Martin, said the trouble with, um, with um, uh, you, Harry, is that you drop your H's too much. So I felt like saying, well, you can shove that up your arse. But I didn't. <laughs> yeah? We have a question from my Twitter. Um, it's from Joe Rawson, who's a legend of Sky Sports. He says, uh, with limited local reach, what can the Sky Sports Network do to promote the sport? Well, 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 believe it or not, does have plenty of opportunity for people to do commentary because they, they do cover lots of things. For example, when I was sports editor of Radio Leeds, we used to have, and I think they still do this programme, a thing called Local Cricket Roundup. And basically, we used to go on the air at 6 o'clock and cover local cricket. So there's two men and a dog watching these matches. But we used to send reporters out. Now, you won't get much money for them, certainly nothing to start with, but boy, is it a good learning curve. Get yourself involved in that. And they still want people to go and report on a cricket match over a telephone and give you 30 seconds on hanging heat and being 64 for two. I'll tell you a story about that as well. Um, I was doing uh, local cricket roundup. It was, uh, it was chickenly against hanging heat or something like that. Uh, great match, you know. We're, we're broadcasting at nine o'clock and you know there's nobody listening to you, but we're still doing it. And we're doing this broadcast and uh, this guy was on the line there. I said, what's the score? And he said... It's 62 for four. I said, okay. Um, uh, who, who, who's batted? He said, Angie Neaton. 
I said, do you think you could just give us a bit more information? There's this massive cheer came up. I said, oh, there's obviously another wicket's gone down. He said, no, Fred's just dropped the one arm bandit, 80 quid jackpot. So you get that. <laughs> and that happened on local radio, I can tell you. Absolutely true is that. Yeah. Yes? Do regrets? Regrets. I have a few. <laughs> um, I suppose the regrets I have is that I was given half a chance in the mid-80s to take a freelance, a freelance contract with BBC Sport. Um, they wanted me because I was, I was on all the big sports things. But um, I was just a bit reluctant to do it because um, uh, of uh, the situation at home. Uh, and I turned it down. On reflection, I'm just saying to take the chances, aren't I, earlier. Maybe I should have gone on that one. But I stayed at Look North. And, you know, in all honesty, I've had such a good career at Look North. I've been so lucky because I've been part of the sports team as well. So uh, regret, maybe not a regret, but sometimes I think what might have happened if. Thanks for the question. Yes, sir. Uh, immense. I mean, I'm a great fan of Sky Sports, I have to say. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking my broadcasting career now, I really do like to, uh, you know, say it as it is as far as the opposition is concerned um, uh, as well. And they are the opposition, but their coverage is absolutely fantastic. But they do control the sport, and the sport did go to um, uh, Sky Sports simply because they offered a lot of money and it went from being a winter sport to, um, to being a summerish sport. Um, is there a corollary to that? What I was also wanting to ask is do you think Sky's coverage has gone too far now the way that they're in their lives and they're getting broadcast on BBC or anything? Well, I mean, it, it's been one of the problems. I, 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 when I came back from Southampton, the Super League show was one of my conditions for coming back. Um, and the trouble with it is we've never been given a regular slot, or the slot we've got is not a very good one. I mean, we've got Tanya's doing it now, and we've got a slot now that's at, at um, uh, half past 11 tonight. Well, come on. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to watch that at half past 11 at night. There's no way. And I, d I doubt any really true rugby league supporter will do, will do so. So there is that to it. But there's also a commitment that you've got to give. B BBC does not have the money that it used to have in terms of the sports rights. And rugby league, for what, however good it is as a sport, doesn't get big audiences. It doesn't get big audiences, and that's been one of the arguments against it. So I think you've got to be a little bit careful about asking the rugby league, yes, um, they've sold the soul, but they've also saved the game, I think, as well. Thanks for, thanks for your question. Yes, I'll try and get around all of you, sorry. What's the proudest moment of your career? I think the proudest moment of my career was a rugby league event, actually. Um, I think it was 1992. I was uh, the BBC uh, radio... Five rugby league correspondent then and they sent me for six weeks to Australia what a trip that was to cover the England um, Australia test series and I was um, doing a commentary at Melbourne and uh, John Inverdale had linked it from the queue outside Wimbledon that day we're going now for commentary from Harry Grace it was early in the morning obviously 12 hours difference or so um, uh, for the game between England and Australia and uh, I know that all of the people there were listening to the commentary, which gave me a great <coughs> thrill that. And England beat them as well, which made it even better, because we don't do it very often, we believe. Uh, that was a great moment, that when I suddenly thought, hey, I'm, I'm doing something that is a bit special, and how lucky am I to be here? Yeah? You've been to um, quite a lot of big sport events around the world, and you've worked as quite a lot of sport and history. What's the most memorable moment in sports history that you've been to? The most memorable individual moment. Um, yeah, I, I think I'd probably have to go to, um, to Australia. And I was there when uh, I was sent as the reporter at that point. I did, I did a strange role in Australia. I did taekwondo, wrestling, a bit of football, a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of the other. Uh, and I was sent on the day that uh, Stephen Redgrave won his uh, medal, you know, fifth medal uh, to the rowing. I think that, to me, made made me so proud to be a Brit because uh, that was a fantastic moment because he'd given it everything into that rowing. It was just sensational was that. So that for me would probably be the, the biggest individual moment and that's a, a sport which I know very little about to be honest. Thanks. Yeah. Um, what's your favourite story that you've covered? Favourite story? Um, 
favorite story I've covered? Um, I, I think it probably would have to be um, a, a sporty one. I'm sorry about this, because sport's still very much part of my life. Um, does anybody know Darren, the name Darren Lehman? Darren Lehman was an Australian cricketer who played for Yorkshire about three years ago. And uh, in his final match against Durham, his final match, he broke or levelled the uh, best ever individual score that a Yorkshire cricketer made. And I absolutely know for a fact that he got himself out with a total, I think it was 364 or something like that. He got himself out on that total because he didn't want to break it, he wanted to level it. And he came in and he, was, he batted for two days and his bat was like this. And he was absolutely and utterly knackered, completely knackered. And do you know what the first thing he did when he got in the dressing room? Got out his cigarettes. I thought it was a great moment. That. <laughs> great moment. That I'll, I'll remember that. So don't you show that on television tonight. It's good. Yeah. What do you make of the BBC's move to Salford? Do you think it's good? Yeah, it's exciting. Very exciting. Um, uh, we've been talking about Media City. It's a really buzzing place, is that? And you, I think you're going to be talking to uh, Peter Salmon this afternoon. You'll be able to find out more what he has to say because he's, you know, obviously that's his baby now. It's incredibly exciting. There's a lot of opportunity there as well. This is what I say to you guys now. Let it settle down, keep at it, and use, use the opportunities that you'll get there because they are phenomenal. They really are. I'll come back in a second. I want somebody who hasn't asked one. Thank you. Is there anyone you saw when you were first looking to get into journalism? Is there anyone who sort of inspired you or you idolised? Yeah, I, I think I, I, I can probably say that uh, my friend John Helm uh, had a big impact on that because he, he got me into it. He gave me the break. Um, John and I are still a great friend. In fact, I mentioned you before, I was, uh, I, I was in hospital for three months last, um, um, uh, just before Christmas, with a fairly serious operation. The first person who was there when I woke up was John. You know, we, we go back a long way. A great, great pal of mine. Um, so you need somebody. You do need somebody. I will say that to you. Get somebody on your side to help you, to nurture you, to just nudge you in the right direction. If you get an interview, get a board or something, somebody who can help you. It does help enormously. Yes, sir. Do you think uh, coverage of rugby league generally is um, enhancing the theory by many nationally that rugby league is enhancing the sport? Well, I mean, we have got to, thanks for your question, we've got to agree that that is the case. It is an M62 sport in some regards. But the coverage that Sky do on a match by match basis is brilliant. It's as good as their rugby union coverage. You know, they put everything into it, and they get so much out of it as well. But the trouble with it is, uh, it's very difficult to make rugby league more than uh, what it is in terms of the national. That's why uh, it doesn't get a national slot, or it does at 3.20 in the morning or something like that, um, which is no real good uh, use to it. And um, I, I think it's a problem. It's a problem. This country, whether you like it or not, I mean, I love rugby union, don't get me wrong, but I think rugby league is a better game one-on-one -on -one than rugby union. I mean, having said that, I watched England Wales on on uh, Saturday night, and that was a fantastically exciting game. It had, it had absolutely everything. But how many games like that do you see in rugby union? Very few. So, how do you break the barrier? The answer is I don't know. I wish I did know. We have tried. We've tried everything to make it, but I can't break the barrier. So, in a sense, I'm agreeing with with your question. It does. Yes, sir. No, I don't necessarily. No, I don't actually think it's absolutely essential. I think it helps. I'll tell you why it helps. I think it helps because it gives you, it may have given you the video uh, skills that you need to impress a potential employer and they don't have to train you or don't have to train you as much. Um, but I, I still maintain, I mean, look at the lady who I present, uh, presented with last week, Amy, um, whilst Crystal was away. Uh, uh, Amy applied for the job as a one-off and, and was given the chance to do it. And she's basically an actress. Uh, she got a lot of uh, broadcasting experience, but basically an actress. They saw something in her that they wanted to develop. And you know, she's got a chance to, to do two weeks uh, uh, next to me. The fact that she's a very beautiful lady, I didn't argue with that either, but there we go. <laughs> but that's a very sexist remark, and I apologise profusely about it. <laughs> uh, can I go back to you in a yeah. second? Do you mind, sir? Yes. Uh, who's been your, who's your favourite person that you've uh, I, I mean, I'm, I like Michael Parkinson. Um, I, I, he's, he's always been one of my favourite guys. Um, 
Um, he's, uh, he's been very kind to me in my career uh, as well. And uh, I, I think Parky would probably be top of the list because I think he does an awful lot of work that people don't appreciate. A heck of a lot of work he does in uh, Barnsley. Just turns up um, to a school and they'll give them a few thousand pounds, you know, just like that, without any media pomp or ceremony. Does it uh, a lot of place called Cuddeth or Cudworth. Uh, does it all the time. I, I like him uh, a great deal. Um, and uh, I like Dickie. Sorry, Dickie Bird. It's a good old boy, Dickie. Yeah? Uh, how important is it to remain impartial when commentating on sport? I, get, I, I suppose I've been into trouble about this in, in the past because when I was doing a World Cup final for Five Live, when I was their rugby league correspondent, it was England Australia at Wembley. And uh, it was a very close game, I think it was 10 all. And there was a kick in the last minute, and the Australian kicked it from the touchline. And I said something like, oh, my God, he's kicked it. <laughs> Meaning <laughs> that he'd, uh, he'd done it. And uh, the editor turned around and said, well, we're supposed to be neutral. I said, but come on. Didn't we want Great Britain to win? We don't want the Aussies to win. But the answer is, I suppose, neutral, no, but not <coughs> against the opposition. That's gobbledygook, I know. Do you know what I mean? You've got to be even-handed. Um, as best you can be. But if you're doing a commentary, you know, England World Cup against Spain, and you're, you're doing it for, you know, our, our BBC, who do you want to win? You don't want Spain to win, do you? Even if they're the better football team. Yeah? In response to that, though, if the BBC are broadcasting for all of the UK, then especially I find with union yep. games that they tend to bias more towards uh, England whenever yep. uh, they play anyone. And what do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know where you're from, but... Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, I, I hope that's not the case, actually, uh, because I think in terms of Six Nations, you know, we, we have to be even-handed. And, and there's been a lot of criticism, uh, not so much about commentary between England and Ireland or whatever. England-Scotland, <coughs> particularly, has been quite... Uh, I think there was an incident, wasn't there, a few weeks ago, when it was Alex Salmond supposed to be on the programme and he was taken off, and there was outrage from people about that. I mean, what Alex Summers knows about rugby, and I don't know, but it was the way that it was done. So, I think we've got to be even-handed, and it's interesting. You, you look at the complaints book uh, all the time, um, and there's certain people who rattle the cage all the time, you know, England commentators who rattle the cage, and it's always quite amusing. So part of it, though, is done to get people watching. And do you want to watch something that's totally bland, or do you want to watch something that's got a bit of oomph about it? That's the question. <laughs> I'll let you think about that. I'll let you yeah, think about that. Like yeah, good. Oh, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's it been like kind of working in Yorkshire for your green? Is kind of more proud of Yorkshire now? Oh, I love the place. Oh, gosh, I love it. I absolutely love it. I mean, when I went down south, that was my missionary work. Um, <laughs> but I, I just think that um, I, I, I love working for Yorkshire. I mean, I've got, I don't know, two, three years left maybe as a, as a, as a presenter, if I'm lucky, if I'm lucky. And... Um, uh, I, I don't want to go anywhere else now. This is my job. I love, I love working for the BBC. I love doing what's, what's Yorkshire. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice thing to be able to uh, uh, reflect on, really. I've, I've, got, I've been given a wind-up. I've got one more question, please. Thank you. Um, how do you feel that the um, construction of the Salford uh, Centre at the BBC will affect the decentralisation of the journalism from London? And can we see other corporations building help Yeah, we're talking about decentralisation uh, and moving to, to Salford. Well, it definitely will, and that's why it's been done, let's be honest. We don't want to be London-centric, and therefore that's why Media City has, has developed. And it's something that I'm sure that uh, Peter Salmon, you know, will be a very good uh, question to put, to put to him, because he's right at the head of that, because he's the boss of it. So he'll be able to answer that uh, big style. But th there has been a feeling that for too long that London has been too dominant in our thoughts and it, it's, it goes back to this idea strangely enough that when you get a little bit of snow in London it's headline news but you get it in Scotland or Ireland and it doesn't get a mention and there is an element to that it's sometimes a little bit you know chip on shoulder I think but uh, there is an element of truth to it so I think that would help big time and also the fact that the television centre in London is a completely not a worn out building as well um, will help as well okay, okay. I did